of a paper which got an Australian woman her PhD in psychology. They gave a prologue because she started her research uh, in studying how people train dolphins in these marine parks. You may have been to some like water world marine parks where they get these dolphins, these porpoises, actually to jump through hoops and to play these like games of water polo. Have any of you seen that? Yeah, you've seen that. How do they actually do that? And how they do that, the trick is, if once if the do dolphin jumps an extra inch higher, you throw it a fish, you give it a reward. If it doesn't jump at all, you don't punish it. You just wait until that dolphin jumps another inch higher, then it gets another fish. And this Australian student of psychology had a great idea. She said, I think I can use this in another area of life. And she went to her supervisor at university and she got permission to change the subject of her thesis from how to train dolphins to how to train husbands. <laughs> and it works! How to train a husband. She wrote this wonderful paper. When he does something you don't like, shut up! Don't do anything, don't argue, don't scold him. But when he does something you do approve of, throw him a fish. <laughs> That's metaphorically. So she told like what happened. When she was going to work in the morning, it might happen to you, the husband could never find his tie. Or oh, where's my sock? I was always asking for something and she was trying to get to work herself. And it was always bothering her, like you know, small things do bother you in a marriage. And so she would always have to stop what she was doing to find the sock for her stupid husband. <laughs> and that would really irritate her. So she used the method they used to train dolphins. When he said, darling, I can't find my shirt, she would ignore him. She wouldn't react at all. She would just go around her business and he would go searching for his shirt. But when he found his shirt, he said, oh darling, I found it. Then she would stop what she was doing. Go up to him and give him a big kiss. Congratulations, husband. <laughs> and it worked. He said in a week or two weeks, he'd always find his own shirts. And she didn't need to worry at all. And that's how to train a husband. <laughs> Or how to train a wife. It's very simple if you know Buddhist psychology. Because just like monkeys are experts on bananas, monks, we are the experts on the mind. We know how it works. So this is actually how you train your wives. What you do, this is I go back to how I learned this psychological technique. When I first went to Australia, I wasn't the abbot, I was the number two monk. And the monk in charge, he was very difficult. So I had to use psychology to get my own way. <laughs> And this is how I used my psychology. I remember being with him and I asked him, I said, why don't we build a hut on the hill over there? And he would say, that's a stupid idea. Don't be ridiculous, it won't work. Now, my idea of psychology was, you don't say anything more. You don't argue. Because I knew that whatever I said had got into his subconscious. All I needed to do was to wait. Sometimes I would reinforce that two weeks later when I knew he'd forgotten. I'd say again, oh, why don't we build a hut on the hill over there? And again he'd say, no, don't be ridiculous, that won't work. Okay, I said, and I waited. 
Usually only two times, maybe three is all you need. And then one day he'd be walking with me and he would say, I just had an idea. Why don't we build a hut on the hill over there? <laughs> it's suggestion. It's like brainwashing, conditioning, hypnosis. It actually works. And when he would say that, I would never let on what was going on. I'd say, wow, what an ingenious idea of yours. I think that would work. Because remember, it has to be, if it's your wife, it has to be her idea. <laughs> and that, say you want to go on a holiday to Perth. So you tell your wife, you know, this is how to train your wife. Why don't we go on a holiday to Perth? Oh, we can't afford it, too expensive. Shut up. Don't say anything more. It's gone into her brain. It's working in her subconscious. Maybe a couple of weeks later. Why do we go on holiday to, to Perth? I know this make it more interesting. Why can't I buy a new car? And she said, oh, no, we've already got one. We can't afford it. Shh. Wait for a couple of weeks. And then say, darling, why don't we buy a new car? Oh, no, no, I'd rather have a new kitchen. Shh, be quiet. And you'll be surprised. Now you come home from work and your wife said, you know, I've been thinking we should get a new car. <laughs> really, darling? Oh, if you really want to, fine. <laughs> That's how psychology works. So you can try that. Those of you who are kids here, if you want to get something from your mummy and daddy. <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> so anyway, that's Buddhist psychology. The problem is we keep arguing. And that's when we get to have this anger and ill will and we never get what we want. So that lady who wrote that uh, thesis, that uh, paper, on how to train husbands. It really, really works. You know, that's why I'm here. Because some years ago, she said, why don't you come to Kuchin? And I said, oh no, I can't come, I'm too busy. And then sometime later, somebody else said, oh, why don't you come to Kuchin? Oh no, I can't come, I'm too busy. And now I'm here. <laughs> how did that happen? So these are ways which you could use Buddhist psychology. And that way you'll find that you know you don't have so much suffering and problems in your life. Now these are things which actually work. But with back to bananas, now one of the things with bananas over in the, the West, now when you have the bunch of bananas, you know what they call them? They call them a hand of bananas. Have you heard that word before, a hand of bananas? which gives another opportunity for a banana simile. And I like telling this story in Buddhist temples. Because I know that in Buddhist temple, everybody wants to be the president. Everybody wants to be the secretary. Everybody wants to be you know, the big shots. But no one wants to clean up afterwards. So, once, there were five fingers having an argument. Who is the most important finger? And the thumb said, I am the most important finger. I am the strongest. The and also, when people say, OK, what thing did you put up? Me. I am the OK finger and I am tough, and I am strong, therefore I am the most important finger. And the next finger said, no, I am the most important finger. When people say number one, who do they put up? <laughs> Me. I am number one finger. I am the finger of wisdom, because I point out things to people. Therefore, I am number one, the wise finger, therefore I am the best. And the third finger said, no luck. <laughs> third finger was, was Chinese. <laughs> no luck. Said, 
I am taller than all of you, therefore I see further. And also, as a Buddhist, we believe in the middle way. I am the middle way thinker, therefore I am the best. No, said the fourth finger, because I am the finger of love. I'm the finger of love because when we get engaged, the engagement finger goes on me. When you get married, the wedding ring goes on me as well. I am the finger of love and love conquers all. Therefore I am the most important finger, the finger of love. <laughs> and I left one last finger, the little finger. <laughs> and he said, actually, you are all wrong. I am the most important finger. Even though people use me to do dirty things. <laughs> Still! I am the most important finger. Why? Because when people worship the Buddha, I am always closest <laughs> to the Buddha. So those of you who go to churches and temples or mosques, the most important person in the temple, church or mosque is the one who cleans the toilets. The one who washes the dishes and mops the floor. The one who does the dirty stuff is closest to the Buddha. <laughs> See, I tell that because a lot of time we have a lot of trouble cleaning up afterwards. Everybody wants autograph, photo, they leave and it's a big mess. So if you want to be close to the Buddha, now you know what you, what you have to do. Well, more banana stories. There was the way that hunters used to catch bananas in the old days. What they used to do is very, very simple. You did not need these tranquilizing darts or these uh, chemicals left out to drug the, the uh, monkeys. All you needed to do was to get a coconut and you'd hollow out the coconut, you know, to get the, the coconut milk and the, uh, the, uh, the flesh, and leave a hole in the coconut just big enough, but only just big enough for a monkey to put his paw in. And you tie the coconut with a strong rope to a tree, and you put a banana inside the coconut, and you'd leave it there overnight. Now, that, a monkey would s surely find that banana in the coconut. And monkeys love bananas. And they put their paw into the coconut, trying to get the banana out. But remember, the hole was just big enough to put a paw in. And if the paw had something inside of it, it couldn't come out. And so the monkey would be trying to get the banana out, but couldn't do it. Because a hole's not big enough to take something. You can take your paw out, but not the paw with something. We're trying to find a way to get the banana out, but couldn't do it. All night, and when the hunter came, the monkey tried even harder to get the banana out. He saw the hunter coming. The hunter came closer, trying frantically to get the banana out. And that's how the monkey got caught. All the monkey needed to do was to let the banana go, and he could run away. But would the, ban the monkey do that? No, because that's my banana. There's many other bananas in the forest, but that's my banana. Just like some young boys when they get dumped by their girlfriend. No, that's my girlfriend. Let him go! <laughs> There's many other girls in the forest. How many bananas are there in the forest? There's thousands of them. 
no need that. Go get another one. Look, I'll tell you, all you boys, I'll tell you a secret. Same with you men as well. Sometimes you look at your wife and you think you want to trade her in for another model. <laughs> no need. Because the secret of life is, if you do trade her in for another model, it's exactly the same. They're all the same. Husbands also, if you want to go rid of your old one and get a new one, all husbands, they're just the same. So you might as well stick with the one you've got. <laughs> just like bananas, they're the same. So why doesn't the monkey let it go and go to another banana? And it loses its life. It's called attachment. It's my banana. It's my girlfriend. It's my boyfriend. You know, because I go traveling a lot on aircraft, I always listen to the safety um, safety advice. They say, if there's an accident, leave your possessions on board and get out as quickly as you can. But can people do that? No, because that's my bag. That's my... <laughs> you get another bag afterwards, you save your life. But because of attachment, that kills many, many people. As for me, I'm not attached at all. I don't worry if I die on an aircraft explosion. Because somebody asked me that once. He said, look, Ajahn Bob, you travel around so much. Aren't you afraid that you know, somebody will go on the aircraft with a bomb in his underpants and blow up the whole plane? I said, no, no, I'm not afraid. Because I can see the three advantages of dying in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet. So this, any one of you who's afraid of travel, please understand there's three benefits from dying in terrorist explosion on aircraft. <laughs> Benefit number one, instant cremation. <laughs> Have any of you ever organized a funeral for your mother or father? Especially Chinese funerals, you've got to invite all these guests you know, for days, feeding them, and some of them you don't even know, they just come there for free lunch. <laughs> and then you've got to do the ceremony, oh it takes such a long time to organise. If you die in an aircraft, it's done on the spot. You don't have to feed anybody, you don't have to buy anything, it's all done. But that's benefit number. Benefit number two, how much does a funeral cost? Thousands of ringgit. If you die in an aircraft explosion, you don't actually pay anything. It's even better than that. The aircraft company gives you money. <laughs> Insurance. For once, your family makes something out of your death. That's benefit number two. But the best benefit is the third benefit. Because if you die at 30,000 feet, it's so close to heaven, it's easy to go the rest of the way. So why be afraid? <laughs> so, so this is how you see things in different ways. And anyway, what's wrong with dying? Now that's, when we're afraid of dying, that's a great example of peeling the banana the wrong way. And I'll tell you why you shouldn't be afraid of dying. Because this is a story from Australia. There was this couple. They'd been married for about 50, 60 years. I don't remember how long. But when one of them died, the wife died, the husband was so heartbroken, he died two days later. I know I've seen that many, many times. Maybe you've seen that as well. This couple, they lived together for such a long time. When one goes, the other one goes a couple of days later. Or a week later. So they live together and they decide to die together. So anyway, just after they died, because you know, they were really good people, did lots of good karma, they appeared together in heaven. And while they were in heaven, they were met by this angel. And the angel showed them this wonderful mansion. Big, almost like a palace. You know, bigger than up there, the Sultan of Brunei's palace. I flew over that the other day. And 
the angel said, because you've been so good, this is your heavenly reward, this beautiful mansion with million dollar views overlooking the ocean. And the husband, the husband said, look, on my salary, I will not be able to afford the government taxes on such a big property. Do you pay government taxes on property in Kuchi? What's it called? Is it government tax or? It's called what? Rates. It's called rates. Just like in the UK. Okay. On the government rates. He said, because the bigger the house, the more you have to pay. Is that right? Yes. He said, it's a huge house. I won't be able to afford this. And the angel said, Sir, we don't have governments up in heaven. You don't have to pay any taxes. It's for free. And then the angel took them inside. A huge mansion with exquisite furniture, you know, from Italy and from France and from Cucci. <laughs> and he saw in the lounge room there was this plasma screen TV, 50 feet wide. And the angel said, it's the biggest plasma screen TV in heaven. And I know that you love watching English Premier League soccer on it. And look, he said, because this is heaven, whichever team you support will always win. It's heaven, no suffering. Even in the bathroom, the toilet was made of solid gold. And the little thing you pressed was a diamond. And no water came out but Chanel number no. 5. <laughs> it was heaven. And the angel said, this is yours. Look, anything you don't like, tweet me, SMS me and I'll change it. <laughs> and he said, look, it's too expensive. I won't be able to afford insurance premium. <laughs> Angel said, you don't need insurance up here. There's no burglars. No, we don't keep them here. And then he took them into the garage. A treble garage. And the first car, the first car was this four-wheel drive, which could go anywhere. You know, have you seen these huge four-wheel drive vehicles, you know, here in Sarawak? They go into the jungles. This was even bigger and stronger. This could go up mountains. I told this story in Sabah. It could even go up uh, Mount Kinabalu. It was so strong, it could even go up waterfalls. <laughs> Try to figure that one out. <laughs> and the second car. <laughs> the second car was a stretch limousine. So big, they had swimming pool in the back. <laughs> and the third car, the third car was a limited edition Ferrari. He'd always wanted a sports car, like most of the men in their 50s. They'd always love a sports car. But he said, look, What's the point of having a sports car in all the traffic? Is it worthwhile having a sports car in, in Sarawak? Even just coming here, there was too many roundabouts. <laughs> you could never pick up speed. And even if you could, too many policemen with their cameras. And that's what he said. And what's the point of giving me a sports car? You know, even if I do get out of the traffic, you know, the policeman will catch me. And the angel said, Sir, there are no police up in heaven. And there are no speed limits. I'll tell you why there's no speed limits in the roads up in heaven. Because if you have an accident, it doesn't matter. You're already dead. <laughs> <laughs> you go as fast as you like. So then he opened up the garage doors and on the opposite side of the road was an 18-hole golf course. And the angel said, 
I know that in your life you always enjoyed playing golf. So we decided because of your good karma to build you an 18 hole golf course on the opposite side of the road to your mansion. And he said that golf course, that golf course has been designed by Tiger Woods himself. <laughs> and I'll show you how he did it. You remember that time when he was running away from his wife and he hit the, the car and crashed? 